please welcome on stage David Spora. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start the last evening of news conference talking not so much about flow and news itself, um, but give you an insight on basically two things. The first thing is um, a bit of project history, how we started out, and how uh, flow and news really helped us improve and uh, what we've learned so far because. I personally had uh, kind of another background, so not uh, being a uh, PHP web developer all the time, so I did web pages before. So I'll give you an insight on that and then um, basically explain how the project grew and how we ended up with a scalable setup uh, using Kubernetes on Google Cloud or in the end maybe Microsoft Azure. Uh, about myself, I'm David, I'm a software developer. Uh, founded Pass Creator about four and a half years ago and doing also consulting for wallet campaigns since then. Pass Creator itself is an online tool to create and manage digital passes. Um, you might have heard something about it yesterday since we have luckily won the uh, NEOS award. And it basically, this is the, the user interface. So you get your graphical representation of a smartphone where you can upload your images and create vouchers, event tickets, stuff like that. These are some of the projects that customers have created during the last years. So there's uh, some bigger companies you might recognize. Um, we've been running projects not only in, in Germany, so mostly this is an international project, or it became an international project. But at first, I want to talk about project history. Basically, this was me about four and a half years ago. So I was just a bit bored and looking for a new challenge. So I was using Typo 3, um, did some projects with it, and wasn't too happy with it. Um, was just looking for a new challenge. And then, since I was in the Typo 3 community, and uh, there was Flow 3, there's still this shiny old logo up there, and that kind of sounded like the future to me. And it was really challenging, since I really didn't know that much about how to build modern web applications using PHP. But what I liked from the very beginning using Flow 3, it does it, or Flow right now, it, uh, that it forces you to somehow code clean and um, stick to conventions, and it really helps you to build projects that are maintainable. And then I started just building some, yeah, Hello World application basically using Flow 3 or Flow and uh, started building something else. So I was looking for a, for a project. And that was when Apple announced Passbook it was uh, back in 2012 at the Worldwide Developers Conference, which is exactly the app uh, that we're creating content for right now. And after they did that, I set up a small flow application where you could just enter your name and got a coupon that you could download on your smartphone. So it was nothing special, but we got about 140,000 page requests in the first six weeks, so I thought I'm up to something maybe. And since you see on the screens, it uh, was called Passbooks in the beginning, was renamed later. And after I did that, we continued developing it and had our first live project in 2013, which was an event in Munich with about 2,000 visitors. So that was the point where we really uh, started digging deeper and continued looking into it since we finally earned some money with it. And I already told that my background was a bit different. So when I started with the Typo 3 pages, my deployment tool was basically this. So I was, yeah, that's the shame part that you already talked about <laughs> this morning. Um, and that obviously was what I was doing in the beginning with uh, Flow as well. I was mainly doing Microsoft stuff back then, BizTalk, application integration, Dynamics Serum, stuff like that. And Falsilla was kind of my best friend. 
and uh, I didn't know much about Linux at all. So I kind of had a hard start uh, doing all that stuff. And as you might imagine, when you have your first live project and still doing this, it's probably a really, really bad idea because, yeah, you break things and you're not really, you, you can't just deploy reliable. So we've learned a lot on the way, um, basically these things, which is uh, mainly I had to get my head around some Linux stuff, SSH even, that's not a joke, <laughs> um, because on that Microsoft products, you just spin up Visual Studio, connect to your server, push a button, and that's it. You don't have to take care about much more, and you even have in the bigger companies people doing it for you, so that was not um, what, what I had then anymore. And continuous delivery using Type 3 Surf, and now we're finally into Docker and Kubernetes since we have a growing number of customers and a large number of passes that are created with the system since about two and a half years. And so I just wanted, you, you've already seen that uh, picture a lot, but I just wanted to say thank you to the core team because it really helped me personally get better at, at a lot of things um, because of the way you're doing things. And I find it exceptionally that this community is so friendly and welcoming and uh, really is trying to help everyone to get better. And that is not just something that you say uh, lightheartedly. Um, I really mean it. And I'd also like to encourage people, maybe somebody is thinking about starting a project. It's really worth it. It's sometimes, yeah, hard to keep pushing. But in the end, you, get, you learn a lot of new things, but I'm not telling you something new. So what about the cloud? Why do we need a scalable setup? Just one uh, question up front. Who's a, who of you guys is using Docker? And who's using Kubernetes or another Docker orchestration tool? OK, that's not, not so much. So hopefully, I'm able to tell you something new. But why do we need that setup that we're um, working on? It's not live yet. We're working on it, and hopefully we'll be able to go live with it in, within the next four weeks. Um, these are the numbers for, from 2015 and 2016. So we had uh, half a million passes that have been created with the system in 2015, 2.4 million push updates sent out via the system, and um, in 2016 it was a bit more. And the thing is, this was not only you have a portion of this number on every day, so you have big campaigns um, where you basically need to scale. And up, up now, until now, we were able to manage yeah, hosting the setup um, using plain old hosting. Um, but there's another problem or another challenge. And this is everything that is orange is where we have users of the application. So the biggest customers are in Europe and Australia and New Zealand. And especially Australia and New Zealand poses a risk because you, of course, get a higher latency when they access your page. And that's why we finally decided to go the Kubernetes and Docker route and really push that forward. We started with it uh, end of 2015 with Docker, getting into it, and for half a year now with Kubernetes. And yeah, like I said, Kubernetes Docker, these are the two, two logos of it. And Kubernetes is Docker orchestration. So it takes a lot of tasks that you have to do yourself from your back um, if, you're, if you want to host it. It also is not that easy to get into it because you have to learn a lot of new things. But basically, it features things like rolling updates. It's self-healing. You can scale seamlessly and automatically. So you really have a setup that is uh, running on a small scale when you need it. And that scales automatically um, if there's a big campaign running. It's open source. It's developed by Google. Um, it's actively maintained. They have about 47 commits that are merged into the project every day um, in 2016. So you can expect to get support or uh, at least answers and help when you, when you have problems. And it's supported by all major cloud providers like uh, AWS, Google Cloud, or um, Azure. 
and a lot of smaller hosters as well. And you, of course, you can host it yourself as well. I want to give you a small introduction to Kubernetes, how it's working, how the, some of the concepts, and then explain our setup that we, are, we ended up using and currently still testing. One concept of Kubernetes is called pods, and a pod is basically a container. And Kubernetes is using nested containers. That means a pod is just a base to run your actual um, containers in it that where your application is running on. And a pod is the outermost container, and inside the pod your actual application containers are running. And Kubernetes is regularizing things. That means a container is always in running is always running inside a pod, even if it's only a single container. Um, and there's one, one sentence that's uh, good there. A, a pod is a collection of containers that are tightly bound. That means you, they can communicate with each other. You don't have to take care of that too much of yourself. Each pod has an IP, and uh, you can just, they can just talk to each other. That's a graphical representation of a pod. So the left one is just a web server that is running inside a pod, and the right one are two containers that is actually what we are using right now is that we have one web server and one proxy container that is accessing Google Cloud SQL, and these are always tied together in one pod. And when you scale them, you scale pods and not containers, which is important in this case. Um, I'll get to that in just a bit. The second thing is services. A service is running in front of a pod. Services have static IPs and DNS entries. So that's basically you can uh, create a Redis service and then talk to it using Redis as a name in, inside your Kubernetes network. And the service basically also acts as a load balancer and uh, knows how to route traffic to pods. That means if you scale the pods behind your service, the service always makes, uh, takes sure or takes care that uh, the traffic is round, uh, routed using round robin principle. And it's also detected automatically when one of your pods is failing, it means something goes wrong with no matter what, your application in that pod is not accessible anymore, then it doesn't get any traffic any longer. So, which is a cool thing, and that pod get, just gets killed and restarted automatically. This is, uh, again, a graphical representation of services. You have a service in front, running various pods behind them, and like I said, the service is uh, responsible for load balancing traffic to the, to the actual pods then where your containers are running in. The interesting part, for us at least, about Kubernetes is uh, called replica sets and horizontal pod autoscalers, which is somehow a tongue breaker. But what it basically does is a replica set ensures that the specified number of pods is always running. It means if you say, OK, I always want to have two pods running inside of my, my Kubernetes cluster of a certain um, application, the replica set always makes sure that exactly this number is there. If you combine that with a horizontal pod autoscaler, you can change the number of pods based on certain metrics like CPU load, um, the requests per second, or you can even build your custom metrics. So you can build an API endpoint and uh, say, OK, if a number is above a certain threshold, the pods should be scaled up. Or if it goes down that number, it, they should be scaled down automatically. And then there's another concept that's called deployments. That's basically a description for pods and replica sets. And um, the cool thing about deployments is when you change your container, so you upload a new image on, on a push to your Git repository, your deployment chain uh, starts running, and then it automatically does a rolling update. It means it's always making sure that the, the, you get zero downtime deployments. And that is working on basically any scale. So you just have to update your deployment, uh, give it the new image ID or the image tag, and then the rolling update is starting automatically. We're using Kubernetes on Google Cloud for a various number of reasons. At first, it's fully managed, so which is, I mean, we're a small company. We don't have that much resources, so you don't have to take care 
that much uh, about the cluster yourself. It also features a private container registry. You get that at a lot of other hosts as well, or even at GitLab, um, that's possible as well. Um, but since it's inside Google Cloud already, it's a lot faster to just uh, fetch the new images into the, con into the Kubernetes cluster. It is scalable, and I mean not the Kubernetes pods themselves, but the hosts running the Kubernetes cluster, and that is something that is a bit harder on some of the others, other providers because on what we're doing currently is just you hit a checkbox and say, okay, scale up up to 10 virtual machines. And if you are scaling the pods inside your cluster and the uh, virtual machines that are running your cluster are running out of resources, they are spinning up new resources automatically and adding that to the cluster. So you, you basically don't have to take care of any of the underlying problems, so to say, yourself which uh, is a good thing in most cases. And like I said, on, on Azure, for example, we had a look at that. Um, it's possible, but there you can scale the, the hosts, but you have to add them to the cluster uh, using some scripting voodoo, um, which is yeah just additional work. And the challenges you basically have on any shared storage, but uh, which also applies to Kubernetes um, or on any distributed system, is shared storage, shared sessions, it's logging and background processes. Since uh, you, make, you have to make sure that your background processes are running exactly once if you need them to only run once, um, you need to collect the log files since Kubernetes or Docker containers should be immutable means that you don't change them during runtime. If you have to change something, you build a new image and just replace it. So you throw your old containers away and restart them, or start new containers with a new version of your application. Um, so that also means that the log files that are maybe created inside of your container would be gone if you don't collect the logs um, in, in any way. The setup we came up with is a container that includes our Flow app, obviously. Um, we're using Google Cloud SQL, which is uh, managed MySQL on Google. And um, like I said, we are running a proxy container running in the same pod that also is uh, including the Flow application. And um, that way we can access the database using localhost that is routed through the proxy container to Google Cloud SQL in the end. Um, it's amazingly fast. I didn't expect that in the beginning, using some proxy stuff inside a cluster, but it really is. We're using Redis, um, Google Cloud Storage for resources. So that is basically our solution to make sure that uh, yeah, nothing is stored locally on the, on the containers. And we're currently working on PubSub for background processes. PubSub is basically a yeah, queuing mechanism inside of Google Cloud, there are uh, solutions for Azure and AWS as well, where you just push messages into, and these messages are then either processed by worker service, or you can um, basically access or do API calls to worker backends or your actual application. And we are also using Cube Lego for Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, Cube is for Kubernetes, and Lego is uh, Let's Encrypt and Go, since it's written in Go language. Our application container is our Flow, Flow app. It is Ubuntu-based, it's running Nginx, and it's heavily inspired by uh, mostly two projects, that is Docker Flow by Martin Helmich from uh, Midwald, as far as I know, and uh, Million12 which really helped us in the beginning, but the problem is that it's featuring too many things that we actually don't need. Um, and then we finally decided to throw that away and build it on our own, which uh, makes it a lot smaller and faster. This is our setup that we are currently working on. We have a controller up front, which is called an ingress controller that is basically defining the domains that you want to use in your, uh, for your applications. We have three of them right now, one with, which is app.passcreator.com, which is not live yet, but it will be, um, which is the front-end application. 
then api.passcreator.com, which is uh, routed also currently to the um, pass creator service, so not the backend service, and we'll maybe change to split that up later. And um, we have our Neos web page that is also uh, running inside the cluster, but I left that out for yeah space reasons, basically. And then we have a pass creator service that is running the Flow app uh, that is accessible from the outside world. We have a worker service that is not accessible from the outside world. Um, that means it's only there for processing background jobs. For example, you can upload uh, Excel files to our application, create 100,000 passes at once, and if this happens, it uh, makes sense to have another service so you don't uh, push that load on your um, actual front-end service that your users are accessing. And both of these services are scalable independently. That means it doesn't matter if we need to scale because of so many users visit visiting the web page or some customer uploading a file that is uh, basically increasing the load on the application. Cube Lego and Redis are only running on one pod, so we don't scale that at Redis simply because it wasn't necessary. Even when we do heavy load testing, it just was able to manage that. And um, Cube Lego is also not uh, scalable since it's, what it does is looking at the ingress definition. I get to that point in just a second and um, creating uh, certificates for that automatically. Like I said, Cube Lego is automated Let's Encrypt certificates. So you have a definition of any domain and tell Kube, uh, Let's Encrypt or Cube Lego um, to create a Let's Encrypt certificate for it. If it doesn't find a certificate, it automatically creates one, and it also takes care of a certificate renewal. Um, Q, uh, Let's Encrypt certificates are only valid for 90 days, so it's not handy to renew them by hand, and that's exactly what this service does. The certificate itself is stored inside a secret. Secret is a way to store sensitive information inside of Kubernetes. And I'll also show you some definition of that stuff later. Persistent resources, the best option you have from my experience, what we did so far, is using one of the uh, big services for it, which is namely S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Azure Blob Storage, is it called, I, I think. Um, there are other options. One is called GCS Fuse. GCS Fuse is basically a wrapper that allows you to store files like you would do um, in, on a file system, but what it does in the background is doing the API calls and storing that files inside a Google Cloud storage bucket in the end. Um, what I've experienced is uh, that it's not fast enough. You can use NFS inside of Kubernetes, um, which is more expensive, at least on, on Google and Azure, which is why, why we've decided against it, and it's also um, not as convenient um, as using the, the cloud storage. If you only have a single container, there's also uh, the route to use a persistent disk, which is like you know from other virtual machines, you just attach a disk to, the, to your Docker container and can save your, your um, files there, and uh, you can back up those uh, things as well. And the cool thing about S3 Google Cloud Storage is it's, uh, you can back up that automatically just by configuring it correctly. And if your cluster crashes or some, some problem with your containers occur, your persistent data is still there. Same thing for Google Cloud SQL or the other managed um, SQL options. It is possible to host your own or spin up your own MySQL instances inside of your Kubernetes cluster, but we've just decided against that simply because um, it takes less time to spin that up. Kubernetes is defined in YAML files. All of you, since you're using Flow, should know how that looks. This is an example for an ingress definition. It's a one application domain, which is in this case gcloud.passcreator.com, and um, one route that is used by the Cube Lego service that is basically the challenge response for creating Let's Encrypt certificates. And um, then we have defined that all the requests that are not um, this one down here are routed to our front end service, which is 
uh, running our Flow app. And the interesting thing is this one up here. This is telling um, basically Kubelago to create a um, Let's Encrypt certificate for what is defined here, basically. So it's using that definition to automatically create your Let's Encrypt certificates, and you could also um, use that setup to spin up new test instances that always uh, get SSL certificates automatically. Deployment definitions, this is what I've explained abstractly before. You basically have a number of replicas. So in this case, we always want to have two replicas, two pods running that are running our uh, Flow application. Then we have our the, the URL to our Docker container in the private registry. We're defining some resource limits. That is 200M, 500M means that it uh, may take up to 50% of the resources of the host, which is in this case a lot. We're still doing some tweaking. And then you define the liveness probe, which is used to um, detect if your pod is healthy. So if that um, URL, in this case it's login, we've built a, a life uh, checking endpoint for that. In the meantime, if that returns a non-200 uh, or 300 HTTP code, the pod is considered unhealthy and it gets restarted automatically. And then you can just define environment variables that are used inside your containers to run the actual application. The service that is running in front of the pods, or in this case uh, deployment, is just defining, okay, what uh, deployment am I talking to, on what port, and um, then def you can define some labels to group stuff and um, use annotations inside Kubernetes. The horizontal pod autoscaler is for us, at least, one of the most interesting parts. In this case, we're telling um, Kubernetes to at least have two replicas of our application containers or pods, and uh, it may scale up to 10 replicas, which is not much. This is a uh, code from our demo setup. And then we define the threshold. In this case, if the CPU load is over 80%, it scales up. If it's uh, lower than 80%, it automatically scales down and kills pods until um, the load is around that or slightly below that measure. How to manage Kubernetes? It's all on the command line, obviously. Um, there's, uh, if you want to just create new pods or a horizontal pod autoscaler, what you do actually is create your YAML file that defines all that stuff that I've just explained run one command, and uh, then Kubernetes is basically doing its voodoo in the background and creating the pods, uh, spinning up new um, yeah, ingress controllers, whatever you've just created. And then you can have a look, of course, of um, what pods are running. In this case, we have uh, four application pods, uh, one Redis pod and one Kubelago pod, which is exactly the setup uh, we are running right now. You can show the ingress definition, which is exactly what I've just showed you. What I'm trying to say is just everything you can define in your YAML files. You can check if that works out on the command line just using some, some um, yeah, commands. And you can also test that after deployment if something works. There's a command to check if the rollout has been completed. So you can automatically check if that worked or not. Um, and you also get a, that's a bit too small, I think, but you can get a history of your scaling events. So you see exactly when it's scaled up, when it's scaled down, for what, what reason. And you can also inspect um, if your health checks have been failing, you see restarts of your pod, so you can detect very well if um, something is wrong with your application. And then, the last uh, screenshot for the command line stuff, you have secrets and config maps. And secrets, like I said, is to store things like passwords, certificates, or other sensitive information you don't want to have. So you don't uh, have that anywhere in your um, files inside your, your images or something like that, which would be a bad idea anyway. Um, so you can use secrets for that and uh, provide these secrets as either you can mount them if it's a SSL certificate, for example, 
or you can just uh, provide them as environment variables, and you can create config maps, which is basically another principle to store configs um, yeah, without interfering with your ap actual application setup. So you can, for example, push, put some special configuration for your Flow application that you only need inside the Kubernetes cluster inside there, mount it into your container on runtime, and then um, you, ha you have uh, a, a configuration for testing, production, whatever. The costs are depending on the resources you use, how many virtual machines, how many storage, how many traffic you have. Um, I can tell you from a production setup, since we're not live yet, but I expect it to be around uh, three to 800 euros a month. Um, mostly, if we're running big campaigns, that might be a lot higher. But uh, on our test setup, it has been about 150 to 300 euros, so it's not that expensive to get started, of course, if you always depending on what you do and how much uh, resources you need. If you want to get started with Kubernetes yourself, um, there are a few resources that I can recommend. One is kubernetes.io, which is the official web page of Kubernetes. There's lots of getting started tutorials um, in detail uh, documentation. There's a Slack channel of Kubernetes that is very active, sometimes so active that they oversee your questions. So maybe you, uh, the GitHub is a better choice, create an issue there. And there's a tool called Minikube, which is basically running a Kubernetes cluster locally on your machine. So if you just want to get started without um, paying for some cloud-hosted setup, that's most likely the way to go. What's next for us? Um, there's the new president in the US that signed some executive orders. And uh, we have some customers that are very data privacy sensitive. Um, which is uh, most likely the reason why we will have two setups, one for customers that are exactly that. So they have data privacy concerns when hosting at a US company's services. Um, I know it's not a legal issue, it's more a trust issue. And uh, that's the reason why we will have one setup for outside Europe customers most likely and one setup for yeah, customers in Germany. Um, Europe might not even a, be a problem because we Germans tend to be a bit more complicated in that area. And um, yeah, our go life will be in about four weeks if we're lucky. And um, we're still trying to get a bit more comfortable with the, with the stability of the system. It's running quite well, but sometimes it's hard to debug, which is uh, our challenge currently to really or get confident enough to go live with it. Yeah, so thanks for listening. And if you got questions, I think we still got some minutes to go. Anyone have any question? We have 10 minutes, plenty of time. Yay! <laughs> Or another coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, not really, because I haven't looked into Ranger. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about your continuous integration process or updates? Um, basically, when we're pushing something, a Docker container gets built automatically by the um, by the GitLab CI pipelines, um, which we haven't uh, really used to um, yeah, deploy things there, but um, I'm just uh, setting it up. But that will be the, the setup we're using. So basically, you push code to your um, whatever branch, then a container is created and uh, automatically updates the cluster in Kubernetes using the command line tools that I've just showed. So there's basically a command to um, update the container inside a deployment, and you create a new uh, version of your Docker container, upload that to the private registry, and then run the command that uh, executes the, the rolling update, which we are doing for a test setup automatically, and in production we're a bit, yeah, more, uh, we're taking care that we're still uh, alive when it's, or awake when we're doing that.
Yeah, well, we're on the topic. At, at which point do you build uh, front-end assets? Um, front-end assets are actually inside the container. So when we build the container, um, we're um, yeah, compiling the uh, SAS files, and uh, we have that inside the container basically to speed up uh, start time of the, of the container. One thing we thinking about, but I haven't found a good way, is um, basically warming up the cache before building the container, but that is very tricky and I haven't found a way to do that yet, but that would obviously speed up um, start time of the container a lot. Um, but uh, the assets are built on, on when we're building it's the part container. Part of the pipeline then. Yeah, right. Okay. More questions? Then thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Um, so we will continue with the next talk, but in between um, we will collect the feedback. Thank you.